Hello everyone, Dr. Christine Smith here, back for another Instagram Live. And today we are gonna be talking with Jeanette about C-section recovery for athletes. She is an expert in C-section, diastasis recti, and postpartum recovery. She is also the um, developer of the Proactive Moms Method. So I'm just gonna go ahead and invite her on here. She should hop on in just a second. But this is just a really important topic because I work with a lot of active moms, athletic moms. There she is, perfect. And I love that she covers this because there's something that happens when you go through this and you may have a C-section planned, you may not. And when you don't have a plan, that can come, sometimes be a bit of a scarier time. And it's a really big process for your body to go through. And so to understand just how big of a process it is, and then ways that you can actually help it recover is just such an important thing. So, hi, Jeanette, how are you? Hey, Christine, how are you? I'm good, thank you. Thanks so much for joining me. Oh, man, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So, I was just kind of saying before you hopped on, like, this is just a really big topic, especially for people who like to stay active. So, I love that you do this kind of stuff for athletes. And I know that you said that this month is also C-section awareness month, I believe. April is, yes. This is a gearing up towards the big cesarean awareness month. <laughs> Beautiful, okay, great. Well, I, yeah, I love that we're talking about this because I actually work with a lot of CrossFitters and just a lot of different athletic moms. And um, it's really hard to get back to doing those things that make you feel like yourself. and make you feel active and make you feel good in your body again after you go through something so dramatic. So let, will you just tell people a little bit about like what you do and how you help moms and different people recovering through this? For sure. So hello, everybody. I'm Jeanette Yi. I see a couple of friends here. Hello, Chige. Chigo and Chinwei are here. <laughs> Rebecca's here. We've got some folks from our code group. This is fantastic. So my name is Jeanette and I'm a perinatal athletic therapist. So what I do is I help pregnant people stay active during their pregnancies, active and pain-free, and then after childbirth, get them back into sport performance, whatever that may look like. So it could be a crossfitter. For me, my focus sports are rugby, running, and let's say yoga. I mean, I do, I do a bit of all those things. So and strength training, of course, is a big one. So I always, I always say, you know, every person who gets pregnant is an athlete. They're like, oh, Jeanette, I don't need to work with you. You're an athletic therapist. I'm not an athlete. I don't work with you. I'm like, listen, you ever play a sport that has lasted nine straight months with no halftime <laughs> that, that ends <laughs> in a mandatory injury, which is a season ending injury. We'll call that childbirth, right? Whether, whether it's a vaginal birth or a cesarean, or a textbook conservative childbirth, it's still an injury that requires intentional recovery. So that's where I fit in. And I take that injured athlete and I get them right back into sport performance. That may be an active, healthy lifestyle with your family, uh, but I also do see elite athletes as well. So we get them into whatever sport that they're playing. Awesome. Oh, I love it. I mean, <laughs> and then I know you said that there's like, a number of exercises and things that are really helpful that we can go over, but I just kind of want to start out helping people understand what it can look like. So, I mean, I know there's a lot of people who they're like, oh, like I'm going to have a natural birth. I'm not going to have a C-section. It's no big deal. Like, I don't really need yeah. to know about that. But sometimes it can like something that you are not expecting can happen and, um, and then it can end up leading into that. And I think it is a much better process for mom and baby if you are somewhat mentally prepared that that might happen so that if it does, just because sometimes it can be a life-saving thing, um, yes. just what that process might look like, what they can anticipate, what it actually involves in the abdomen and like why recovering and focusing on proper recovery is such a big deal. Oh man, okay. So this that is a big question. To take out my, <laughs> I'm gonna take out my scalpel. <laughs> And I'm going to draw it on my stomach so everybody can see. You know, I feel this is the best way to describe yeah. things. Totally. You know, what I'm going to share with you, Christine, is the thing that I saw when I first started getting into cesarean rehabilitation, and it just blew my mind. I was like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. C-section. Yeah, you, you give birth through a cut in your stomach. I get it. And they're like, no, 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 no. But do you actually know what happens in the surgery? So it's like I was speaking to a physician, and I was like, no, no, just like, why don't you tell me? 
So she goes, okay, here is your scalpel and here is the pregnant belly. So there are actually three incisions that happen in a cesarean birth. And I was like, three? What do you mean? So they're like, okay, the external incision is somewhere between the belly button and the pubic bone. And then once the skin and the fat layer is resected, there is a blunt incision that goes down the linea alba where the diastasis recti is. Everybody listening in. Thinning and widening of the linea. Okay, so that is cut open essentially with the surgeon's finger because it's so thin it doesn't require a scalpel. And then your abdominal musculature is pulled open. And then your uterus, and it's got a whole bunch of other stuff happening, of course. But but essentially, when it's all that's moved aside, you've got your uterus, and then there is a full thickness incision through that uterus. The uterine wall is resected, your baby is presented, you birth your baby. And then Christine, this is the cool part that I was like, what? This gets stitched back together, which is the uterus. This, which is the linea alba, in general is not stitched back together. And that to me is a physical athletic therapist. I was like, what are you saying to me? You mean the muscle? it's not it used to be but it's not standard practice anymore and then the physician goes on to say and then externally this is either stitched or stapled and or glued and then there's stary strips on top wow it That's is definitely it's quite a process uh i actually i did a surgical internship at one point and did got you? to see a whole bunch of c-sections happen yeah you did i did i've never seen one I've they never, are oh, um it is not a super gentle process, um, and it definitely really? depends on your surgeon. Um, okay. the, so I was observing at a hospital in Thailand, actually, and um, I remember during a couple of the surgeries, in order to stitch up the uterus, uh, he actually took it out of the body, flipped it onto the stomach, stitched it up, and then put it back in. So oh this, I know, right? So when we're talking about fascia and stuff, this is why recovery is so important, because yeah. fascia is basically this web-like gel substance that's almost like this spider web that spans through your entire body. And I know uh, Jeanette had just done a post the other day about like how this can affect your pelvic floor without people actually realizing it. So I'll let her touch ah. on that in a few minutes. But yeah. it's just, it can be a very intense process for your body. And so it's like, we're dealing with all the fascia that she just covered and showed you. And then we're also dealing with the internal fascia, which is basically like it's the suspension system for your organs. And so it's really flexible and dynamic and it's amazing, but when it gets kind of like twisted or whatever throughout this process, mm -hmm. it takes time and movement to help it actually get back into its normal framework. So um, our scar tissue is amazing and like it'll form scar tissue and you'll heal and it's incredible, but the movement and everything that Jeanette does and her program is so important because it helps it um, rebuild correctly and like realign correctly and get back into this natural format. So I don't know, like what else do you think is like one of the, so we had kind of talked about the process of like what happens, but yeah. like what's some of the mental things that moms can prepare for just to make this like a, an easier process if this is something that's unexpected for them? That's a great question. Right before I get into that, I see the, that uh, there's a question that came in about uh, why they don't stitch up the linea alba anymore. So I just wanted to briefly touch on that. For anybody who's a physical therapist or involves with working with cesarean birth clients, uh, it's one of those things that I think is so important to understand, right? So if the linea alba isn't held together artificially uh, with stitches to encourage approximation of the tissues while they're healing, that has implication on how much that tissue can and should be loaded during that critical healing period which easily is the first six weeks, easily. Like you're not, don't load it. And why don't they not necessarily stitch it? So this was explained to me, this is not a research paper that I have read, but speaking to physicians, apparently peer reviewed literature says that the outcomes of a cesarean birth, whether the linea alba is stitched or not, is 
the same. Like there's not enough of a deviation to say that it should or should not be. So I, I guess it saves time. I guess it, I mean, like if it's going to heal anyways, why put extra, you know, stitches into a body? Um, but <laughs> as you and I are, you know, physical and not, you know, medical professionals in the healing space, I, I could say that the outcome, the physical ability of a person who has both sides of their six pack held together versus not is very different, is vastly different for the first critical weeks of healing, right? Like, yeah. Would you agree? Right. Yeah. And then after which point, if the scarring happens optimally, uh, yeah, then the outcomes could be similar in terms of pain, strength, control, function. Yeah. But I mean, like, so I'm not too sure uh, what, what their outcome measurements were in those studies. Well, so that's and <laughs> for people who don't know, let's like talk a little bit about what diastasis recti is, because I think people might have like heard the term, but not everybody's yeah. totally familiar with it. Um, but it's or actually, yeah, I'm just gonna let you go on explain that. <laughs> so the way the way diastasis recti has been uh, explained in the literature more recently, like in the past two years, is they're really trying to push the idea that uh, the linea alba naturally thins and widens during pregnancy. And because it's natural, uh, researcher tr researchers are trying to get us to get away from actually using the term diastasis recti during pregnancy at all, because it's not pathological. Mm. And to save the term diastasis recti, to refer to a linea alba that is still widened and thinned after, and don't quote me on this, probably the three month more postpartum. So the idea is it's a natural lengthening and stretching and it's a natural coming back. Uh, I shouldn't say the gap closes naturally. It, it can, it can, but that isn't the only thing that indicates whether or not you have recovered. The idea is the body naturally stretches and it does naturally come to some kind of pre um, 40 weeks pregnancy uh, measurement. And, and uh, you know, the tissue start to regain its uh, connectivity and its tensile strength again. Uh, the best people to ask, actually, Christine, are the two women who are going to be coming on and speaking about it. Three women who are the world's leading diastasis experts. So they'll be on Ask Jeanette on the third week of April during my C-Summit to talk specifically Perfect. about diastasis recti recovery after cesarean. So that's during the C-Summit on my platform. We're gonna have Grania Donnelly come in from Ireland. We're gonna have Sinead Dufour, one of the leading researchers in Canada, and Munera Houdani, which is a very well-known diastasis educator in educating educators. So. Perfect, well, and I'll yeah. touch on this now and I'll also touch on it at the end. So yeah, Jeanette's gonna be hosting a summit in the month of April for all of this kind of information. So that's one of the reasons I just wanted to have her on now was to kind of get like a little sneak preview. And then also just because I work with all these moms and stuff and you know, I, I work with fascia and different things and stuff in my own practice, but I love collaborating with minds, right? Because no one can be great at everything. So this is how we all get better as practitioners is by sharing thoughts and sharing knowledge and growing wisdom beyond our one singular perspective. So, when I kind of think about diastasis recti stuff, it's exactly like she was saying, but it's like, it's kind of this where your muscles start to split apart and that stretching is natural. But then a lot of the time, if you're like an athlete or something, you like to lift heavy things. You like to do stuff that requires core strength. And if yeah. you can't get those to come back together, ideally, then it's almost like having a herniation where it's like your abdominal organs will kind of push out. So you'll know if you kind of have this, if you try to do a sit up and you get kind of this bulge in like the center of your abdomen, and that'll kind of tell you, ooh, maybe that stuff isn't bending quite well. And so yes. then I also kind of think about, and we'll, we'll touch more on like the exercises and the fascial kind of things, but C-section birth, either one of those both together are like, a very intense process for the female body that is like this incredible thing that it does but that we've also just totally normalized like oh yeah I had a c-section and then and but no it's like you had these incisions into your abdomen and it's like a really intense thing and so we also have to talk about the healing process right and so yeah. like things that people can do after birth that help heal these tissues and help mend them one of the biggest things you can do is your nutrition 
which I talk a lot about. And so it's like making sure that your body has the right amino acids, making sure that you are eating the right things, making sure that you are not eating an irritating inflammatory diet. Because I think something, and I mean, obviously when we're pregnant, we get weird cravings, all of those kinds of things, and that's justified. But it's like, I've seen things on different feeds where, you know, someone will get cravings and then you'll see just packets of junk food. And it's like, those things are not going to really help your body heal in the most ideal way. So if you can try, like if you're getting a sweet craving, if you can try to orient your something towards something more naturally sweet, like blueberries, blueberries are really cool for helping cellular regeneration. And a lot of people don't know that. So those things, um, lysine, um, plenty of protein, all the building blocks for these yeah. tissues, that's going to be one of the most important things for helping these tissues to actually heal better. And I think it's something that sometimes gets left out. And I think during recovery and post birth, when your body is going through this whole entire major hormonal chemical reset, it's one of the most important times to do this. And so I don't know if you have any thoughts on that as well, but I'd love to hear them. Just briefly, I, I totally do. You know, I talk about, you know, optimal health being well, it's four pillars, but really from an athletic therapist stand standpoint, it's like eating, sleeping, and exercise. The, the fourth being the mental health component, which is massive, but that's not my wheelhouse. So eating, sleeping, exercise. So the eating part, I always find fascinating with all the different athletes that I've had the opportunity to work with over the years is the cultural foods that people eat after childbirth and you know people's moms will come in and you know in the Indian culture shockingly very similar to the Chinese culture shockingly very similar to the Korean culture and to all these different cultural foods that come in that for us in North America would be like oh wow that's like really anti-inflammatory oh yeah that's like chock full of protein amino acids oh yeah bone broth for example is a staple basically in all those different cultures and, and probably many more that I, I have not come across with postpartum nutrition. So yeah, just to your point, there's a reason why those cultural foods postpartum exist and have existed for thousands of years. Yep, absolutely. And I think honestly, I'm such a proponent of bone broth for just like anyone, yeah. like every single day. Um, one, because it's incredibly healing to your gut. And that's another thing that people don't really talk about with like going through something like this, right? And I've talked about it in a couple other lives that I've done, but it's like, Basically, this is a major injury to your body. And most people like wouldn't think of calling themselves injured after birth, but no, like you're injured. You need time to recover and your tissues are healing. And so this is a great time to treat it like any other injury. Like you need rest, you need plenty of natural fluids. Like a lot of people will drink lots of fluids, but forget to drink water. So like you just need plain water sometimes. I saw a clip of something the other day and it was like, sometimes we just need to drink a bunch of water and sit in the sun like some wilted houseplant. And it's like, yes, I think that's <laughs> very accurate, especially when we're healing. And so like bone broth is an amazing thing for that because one, it has a lot of water, but then it has all these really rich nutrient amino acids. It also has tons of vitamin B12. Vitamin B12 is needed for actually um, stimulating cellular regeneration. Like your cells actually can't replicate without it. So making sure you're getting your B vitamins, all that kind of stuff. So this is why we want to ideally work towards something that is mostly kind of like a, a bit of a paleo diet where it's a lot of vegetables. Cooked vegetables tend to be much gentler on the body during a time when it's healing. And especially if it's like winter and cold outside, and that goes into more like Ayurvedic medicine concepts. Um, but then also bringing in a lot of just yeah, just natural healing proteins. If you're vegan or something, finding some way to make sure to get those nutrients into your body because you still need it. Um, so let's come back to some more of just kind of like the fascia stuff. So let's go through like a little bit of a timeline for people. So, okay, so we just had the C-section done and then they're recovering in the hospital. Like what does a recovery timeline look like? Or maybe if they're doing something like your program, like when can people kind of yeah, just like, what would that timeline look like? I, think, I guess that's the best, simplest question. So the way I describe it, that would be the easiest to understand is scar tissue takes six months to basically become permanent. So scar tissue is like glue in the human body. This is how I describe it to my athletes, to the lay person. And it's like, well, you need the scar tissue for the first six weeks. Please don't disturb 
those incisions that I just drew in my belly, right? Don't disturb them. Please let them heal approximated as close together as possible. You pull them apart the more you move in terms of, you know, I'm going to go and try to get to the gym. I'm going to lift a couple of weights. That's why the surgeon says don't lift anything heavier than your baby, which is generally 10 pounds or less, and only if you need to. But then after you get discharged by the physician, you know, the, what, what I really try to highlight in my coursework in both courses, whether it's the foundations course or the course for athletes, is that you have six months to really make an impact on that scar tissue. So for those of you just hopping in and listening, Dr. Christine was just talking about how, you know, scar tissue is super important, but it's, it, its job is to heal tight. It's to hold stuff together so it doesn't split open again. And thank goodness for that. However, if you have scar tissue that's going to go from this level all the way down through into your uterus and all your internal organs, that's a heck of a lot of stuff to be stuck together. So what I try to explain to people is you got six months to try to get things A, to not be so tight, B, not be so stuck together. Get the things stuck together that should be stuck and get everything else unstuck. It's kind of the simplified form. So that's like a six month window. Now, a lot of people start hearing about scar massage almost at the six month window or after. And there's a big feeling of, oh my God, is it too late for me? Because I am still having symptoms. I'm still having pain. I feel very weak still. I am having pain with sex. I'm not able to touch my scar. How the heck am I supposed to massage it? So to that cohort, I would say, while the scar tissue is pretty much permanent in terms of flexibility and stickiness by the six month mark, your fascia, which is living and breathing, can be impacted for decades to come, basically for the rest of your life. It's living and breathing, it's made mostly of water, it's supposed to, right? It's supposed to adapt. So that kind of in a nutshell is how I describe the coursework. Beautiful, I love it. And I saw some questions pop in while you were talking and I think they were related to some things we were talking about earlier, but I wanna make sure not miss them. Uh, someone had asked uh, if you ask them to stitch your diastasis recti or your linea alba afterwards, uh, will they do that? And that might be something that'll be answered in your summit, I don't know. That's a great question. I will ask the physicians that are coming on. So Excellent. will- Thank you. Will my linea alba be stitched if requested? Okay, and then the other thing that popped in was someone said um, that if you're, that your baby might be cow protein intolerant and so that beef bone broth may not be ideal. I actually do agree with that statement. Um, mm. There's something that's happened in our agriculture just with the way that we've kind of overbred things um, and just the way that we feed them. Even if you do grass fed stuff, there's just something about beef protein that tends to be more inflammatory for people than other types of game meat. So, um, and you know, it's pretty hard to find like bison bone broth, but it's really easy to make chicken bone broth yourself and then end up with chicken for the entire week too. So I literally just take a whole raw chicken, stick it in a crock pot, fill it with water, throw in some carrots, some celery, like one of those poultry herb packs, which is usually like rosemary, thyme, sage, and something else, some peppercorns, some salt, six cloves of garlic, and you let it cook for like 10 hours, and then you're done. And then you just take the whole carcass out, you peel off all the chicken, and you have bone broth for the whole week and chicken for the whole week. So that's just like a really easy way to do that for yourself. And honestly, I think the ones I make at home taste better anyway. <laughs> um, so <laughs> yes, to that, comment, it. to that <laughs> comment, I am a, I'm more of a fan of uh, poultry-based bone broth, but also that's where like working with a functional medicine practitioner comes in and like I run a lot of food sensitivity tests for people and that's where I can find out like what are you sensitive to and usually for the most part most of the time your infant is probably going to be sensitive to the same things you're sensitive to and so because you actually share a, a biome and then I don't know maybe Jeanette can comment on this a little bit too but um, one of the things that can be really helpful for your kiddo if you are having a c-section done one of the things that they miss out on 
is basically getting the inoculation of the vaginal flora as they travel through the vaginal canal. And so um, they will have the mother or the physician basically swab the canal and then rub it around the nose and the mouth oh. of the infant so that they can ingest mom's microbiome and it helps their immune system, helps prevent allergies, helps prevent asthma. There's a whole bunch of studies on it. It's super cool. So um, just cool. when it comes to food sensitivity type stuff, it's all related to your gut and your microbiome and your flora and all that kind of stuff. And this is why I love talking back and forth, right? Is because like we both have different areas of expertise and Jeanette's way more knowledgeable on like certain exercises and like how the scar tissue forms and all this. But like, I love working on that kind of stuff with moms where it's like, hey, let's make sure your kiddo's immune system's working properly since they had a different experience. And then when it comes to like exercises for baby and stuff, I'm just gonna throw this in with my perinatal pediatric stuff that I do because I love it. Um, so when kiddos don't get to go through the canal and they are born C-section, yeah. something else that happens is they don't get the pressure from the yeah. canal, which means that they don't get certain primitive reflexes activated. And I've is talked to a right? lot of moms who will take their kids to a bunch of behavioral specialists. Yeah. And I'm like, hey, did they ever check their primitive reflexes? And then they go, what are primitive reflexes? Wow. So it's like, no one ever talked to them about this. And it's basically like just little things I'll do for kiddos, like a stroke up the back or um, like on the foot. And this is a lot of what chiropractic is for pediatrics is it's actually very neurologically based. Um, and I do the same thing for mom too, right? Like when mom comes yeah. in before, during and after pregnancy, it's about balancing your nervous system. So for kiddos and especially like newborns and stuff, it's a really, really light touch kind of thing, but I'm going through and I'm making sure that all their primitive reflexes are like the boxes are being checked which means that their brain is developing correctly. And so that's actually, you can actually sometimes see a connection between like, um, just like challenges in learning or processing of the sensory world um, for kids who maybe didn't get to go through the birth canal, mostly because their primitive reflexes aren't integrating correctly. So little tangent there, but fun fact. I know, well, I think right? that's so important, right? I mean, we have somebody writing in here saying, oh, I, I requested for the physician to do what you're describing. But then she said herself, she's like, well, maybe that's not within their wheelhouse. And it sounds like it's specialized. I mean, I don't know everything about giving yeah. vaginal birth, but I mean, this is the first time I'm hearing about it, but it makes yep. sense, you know, even as a, you know, athletic therapist. So I'm like, well, it's very different if the first thing in my life is I'm being crushed cranially through a vagina, it's the first thing that happens <laughs> in my life versus let's say my little brother born through like this very peaceful sort of, oh, right out of my mom's belly. I'm sure that impacts us from a very, very, like, like from, from the very beginning, from the yep. very beginning. So that's very cool. So, that you're well, and like, I've and always this, this all comes back to like the exercises and the stuff that you do, right? Because it's like, so the exercises work on scar tissue and it works on fascia and it works on all these things, but it's like, yeah. why is that important? It's important yeah. because it's how our body senses our movement in space and how it integrates and how our brain and our body talk to each other. So yeah. like, I would love to talk some more about like some of the exercises that you Let's like do, do in your program. Let's do it. Let's do it. Should we hop right to the very end where we have specific uh, specifics? I try to get my athletes to get to by the six month mark. Or do you want to be more like global and start the very beginning should be applicable for everybody? Let's go in like a timeline based form because I think uh, it's really cool for people to get sure. to see like the progression of things. And yeah. I know like I was watching one of your videos earlier and you were talking about like a bear crawl and then like you want to do that for a certain period of time and then that would be like the first step into getting towards a plank or something like that or um, like you were talking about just just primal movements and like there's a couple primal movements and I did yeah. grab my yoga mat in case we need to demo anything. So I love that you're demoing. This is great, right? Because I'm ready. Just sit here I'm and ready. talk. So yes, yeah, please got, show us. I got my B mat from B Yoga here. This is my beautiful cork mat, ideal for sweaty yoga practice people like me. <laughs> I don't know about you, but when hands sweat, like it just slips over everything. But the cork mats are really great by be yoga now and they uh, suck up all my fucking hand sweat but aside from that let's talk about fascia from the very beginning so if you're just hopping on now fascia basically the way i describe it is the connective tissue that gives our body its shape so it's not just the skin 
it is the skin and then everything that surrounds like the fat and through the fat is everything that surrounds the muscles and the muscles and everything through every single muscle group and cell. And then it like becomes a tendons which encapsulates the bones and becomes part of the organs that suspend. Like it's everything. It's so everything. cool. Yeah, it's, it's everything. So when we talk about, okay, geez, I just had a major abdominal surgery. Where do I even start? We don't even have to be too complex. The, the thing about how I like to approach perinatal therapy is that I, I love telling people that it's not, it doesn't have to be complicated. It actually, if you hit some very key pointers, like kind of Christine, what you were saying, like there are some like primal movements, you know, everybody's got to breathe. Yeah, get those things down. You're pretty okay. However, if we don't kind of have that uh, process mapped in our heads, we don't know the checklist. And then there are a lot of things we actually can miss or omit entirely for even years and possibly our lifetimes. So if we start at the beginning, uh, fascial movement uh, with, let's say, breathing. So I begin with the ABCs. So ABC stands for alignment, breathing, core control which has everything to do with your posture. And then of course your breathing, which is the roof of the powerhouse, which is the core and includes the pelvic floor. So Thank it's all- Yes, people forget that your core is actually a sphere. So it's like your diaphragm, your pelvic floor and all yeah. your body muscles. Yep. Totally. So if we think about the ABCs, alignment, breathing and core control, which is the house, the powerhouse, then the first exercise that you can do right after having a cesarean or a vaginal birth is literally belly breathing. So if people on here want to just join me for this, it doesn't sound complicated, but if you've never <laughs> done a belly breath, it's actually pretty hard. So, and it doesn't have to be. So here's my, you know, drawn on incisions for people who are just hopping on. Don't be shocked about like, oh my gosh, you know, that's something happening. This is my drawn on three incisions for my, uh, my cesarean birth. But if you just place your hand on your relaxed belly, friends, everybody, let's do this together. If your belly is relaxed and you inhale into your belly, if you inhale into your belly, your fingertips will come apart. When you exhale and take the air out of your lungs, your fingers come together. Inhale, fingers come apart. Exhale, fingers come back together. And I love doing this in front of the mirror with my hands on my belly. Why? Because then you get two types of feedback, visual feedback and tactile, meaning touching. Basically, everybody who can get the visual and or manual feedback will understand much better how to do the belly breathing. Now, how does this impact the fascia as it's healing? Well, you know, a couple at the beginning of our session here, we were asking, like, what, what about, like, the emotional impact of a cesarean birth? Belly breathing will impact positively the emotional like, birth trauma, you know, the whole uh, I feel shame about something that I did not expect or want. Any negative experience will upregulate your system and cause more stress response and belly breathing down regulates all of that. And I just want to throw in how important I think what she's talking about right now is for a number of reasons. So it's like, yes, we know that like, okay, deep breathing calms our stress response, but on a biochemical level, what's actually mm -hmm. happening is that your stress response, your cortisol response is built from the same building blocks as your neurotransmitters and a lot of the things that are used to heal your tissues. So if you're stressed out and you're running that stress pathway and your mind is running, you're actually stealing from your body's ability to produce your happy chemicals and produce your healing hormones. So this deep breathing does a lot more than like basically by calming you down and by bringing you out of that stress state, it also stimulates your healing pathways and gives you your happy thinking chemicals back. So yes, super important. Oh, I love that. See, look at that. Even more reasons to belly breathe, friend. <laughs> belly breathe. I'm going to belly breathe more. I don't want my stress to take away my happy chemicals, Christine. <laughs> I'm going to think about that after today. So the belly breathing will impact not just the belly. It impacts the diaphragm and the pelvic floor. And without getting too much into it, just know that everything is synergistic, meaning what happens here impacts here and here 
Well, 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 everywhere, but it's your entire core canister. So this is safe to do day one after childbirth if it doesn't increase your pain levels. So for some of you here who may be day one post cesarean, you might find like, oh my gosh, if I take a really big breath. Oh my gosh, it gets to like a four out of 10 on the pain scale. Don't do it, don't do it. But can you take smaller belly breaths and have it still be at a zero or one out of 10 on that pain scale? And then after you take five slow belly breaths, same size, does your pain start to decrease? Because if it does, that is going to be helpful for you, not hindering. Yes. More is not better. To all the athletes here, more is not better. <laughs> yes, it's about <laughs> listening to your body, please. And I yes. often tell people, like, if something is above a four out of 10 pain level, like, please don't do that. Like, we want to keep it like below four out of 10, around like the three out of 10. And yeah. Let's... yeah, right, Christine? Especially uh, us athletes, we're like, yeah, nine out of 10. I want to feel it burn. Like, I know it's helped me. Pain is good. You know, that may be more accurate when we're towards the end of rehab, right? When, when, when we're just post-surgical, you are rehabilitating. Where strength is not your goal, movement is your goal. Movement quality, I should say, which means you're reteaching your body how to X, Y, Z. In this case, you're reteaching your body how to breathe. So that's, that would be step one of like fascial mobility at the earliest stages. But then let's fast forward a couple of weeks. And by the way, every body is different. So what I'm demonstrating and giving you guidelines for timelines is, is very, very just generic. Every body is different. You may be well ahead or, or not at these guidelines that I'm, I'm telling you about. These timelines, I should say, timelines. Well, it's very much what she's talking about is like listening to your body, which I think so many people have just kind of forgotten how to do. And if you just went through birth, you realize that like the whole entire process is about listening to your body and like just feeling like what's happening and trusting your intuition and like trusting your innate intelligence. And so exactly what she's talking about. It's like every, every healing timeline is going to look a little bit different. Like when I was healing from an injury of mine, they were like, yeah, you'll be back in like four weeks. Yeah, I had to double that. My body just needed oh, double the healing time. And so that was just realistic. And so it's like, take everything with a grain of salt and listen to your body. So please continue. This is great. I love this. Oh my gosh. Someone's give a shout out to have, we have a couple of new people dropping in here. Feng Hong is in here too. Thank you friend for joining in. So now here's the thing about, uh, I, okay. You were saying, yes, being an athlete, one of the big things that sets an athlete apart from someone who may or may not be as successful is how well we can listen to our bodies. Truly, we have the wisdom to heal if we just listen. Now, many athletes, for many reasons, myself included, would rather push and just take the pain because we want to succeed. And our definitions of success must change after a major abdominal surgery if you still equate success with pain is good. It, it's, it's, it's a huge, uh, you know, when you, Christine, you asked about what, what are the emotional impacts in my cesarean courses, both of them, I, the whole first of four teaching modules is only about the psychology of healing. And this is from someone, I'm not a sports psychologist, but you and I both know, like, who's going to get better? Two athletes, both broken ankles. Is it the athlete who's like, okay, you said six months doc she gets really upset she cries but then she's like okay what's next show me versus her teammate same injury is told the same thing and wallows in sadness and depression for those six months we know which athlete will have a better outcome despite having the same access to the same healthcare providers and doing the exact same exercises well and that goes back to that chemical path the way we were just talking about where your stress and your Nice. grief and it's like I don't want to negate the grief process right because like I've, I've been through that with my own injuries there's a weird grief experience that comes with all of a sudden not being able to do the things that make you feel like yourself and that's real but it's like when you start to feel depressed from whatever you're going through just know that it's like it's a literal biochemical pathway going on in your body of your stress hormones stealing your happy hormones and your healing hormones so the best thing that you can do is exactly what Jeanette is saying which is like focusing on the next step 
kind of coming to this place of acceptance that like you're not a broken human being and you will heal and your body has incredible capacity. And if you can support it with the right nutrition and the right emotional support around you, that's going to be your best bet for healing. Absolutely. Now, the physical healing part, which is my job, I think is the easiest. <laughs> like, quite frankly, here's your exercise program. I'm going to show you how to do the exercises. That's my job. Quite frankly, I have the easiest job. The hardest job is the athlete's job. She has to, she has to execute every single day. Literally, it's an every single day. Now, I say every single day, but I also want to not overwhelm people who are listening here and understand it's five minutes a day. In those five minutes, half of that time is doing scar massage, which Christine and I aren't going to be talking too much about today, but the other half is exercise. And I don't even call it exercise, because when, when we talk about sports psychology, to an athlete, when you hear the word exercise, you think, gotta lift heavy, gotta go hard, gotta go to the gym, and gotta spend an hour on it. No. We'll just, we'll just call it movement. So we call it, I call it movement. So it's massage and movement. Five minutes of massage and movement. So let me just quickly show you how it would progress that belly breathing. So in no particular timeline, I would get from this belly breathing to, hey, can I move my arms? Because your arms are connected to your chest, which is connected to the same fascia as your abdominal wall. For anybody who's gone through a, a major abdominal surgery, the arms, you, you, can, you could move without pain for the first couple of weeks. You couldn't. So that becomes part of your physical rehabilitation. And then of course, like, well, if I gotta move my arms, do I gotta move my legs? You're right, you do. So what if you move your legs in terms of walking? Now, I know the screen is so small here, really got half the Instagram screen, but pretend I'm walking, friends. Like if you walk with small steps, that's very different than walking with, I'm gonna take a big step now. Here, that's a big step. And you can see that that's gonna pull on the fascia because my leg is actually attached to my abdominals via that connective tissue. So part of fascial mobilization or scar mobility is literally moving your arms and your legs within your pain tolerance. You listen to your body. And then we go more specifically into the types of movements that will really focus in opening up the abdominals. So what I've created in my, in my programs is basically a flow chart because I don't know about you, Christine, but I'm like very type A. I want to know where am I, what do I need to do and how many things do I need to do by when show me <laughs> yep. and I will execute. <laughs> so, so I made a flow chart. And I love it. Chart, That's awesome. Right? Like yeah, I made a flow chart. So the flow chart uh, covers, like I said, massage and movements. Now for the movements, uh, let me just explain to everybody here. I separate that into four different categories of movements. And people may not think, oh, okay, well, I have this diastasis, I got the cesarean, and I've got to, like, rehab both. I guess it'll just get better if I was, whatever, the doctor said it'll be fine at six weeks. So I like creating little things like categories because you can think more critically about, oh, if I could do a movement in each of these categories – then it actually focuses on the movement and tissue extensibility that is needed while I really heal over those first six critical months. So what are the four categories? And this is just like Jeanette Yee making things up. So this is not based on anything other than Jeanette Yee's brain over 20 years of practice. But please, everybody, use this. And un like, if you don't have a plan, try mine. It works for a lot of hundreds of my athletes. <laughs> So the first one is open the front body. First category of movements is open front body. This is opening the front body. It's not called lateral arm raises or like, like it's, it's not, you can open the front body doing Pilates, doing weight training, doing yoga, doing like any housework. It doesn't matter, but you got to open the front body. Secondly, you got to strengthen the back body. So once you open the front, you can't just say, okay, well, that was good. You got to teach the body how to hold all that. So I'm just going to tip this down. What if you then strengthen the back body in something like a Superman? Now, when we do a Superman, that involves you being confident in lying on your stomach. So a lot of post-surgical moms don't even think about lying on their stomachs because quite frankly, during pregnancy, you have to lay on your stomach for at least six months already 
Then you have a surgery, maybe surgery, and then now it's been nine months, and yeah, I just never laid on my stomach. So this also is part of that psychology of healing, right, Christine? It's like, I have a fear about this. And then you get over that fear. You know you're not going to hurt yourself. That opens up a whole new, like, video game level of exercises, right? You can lay your stomach. There's a lot you can do. <laughs> so, right, like, what is the second category? Strengthen the back body. You can do it like this. You can do, oh my gosh, it doesn't even matter. You can do like, you can do rows. Like, that's a back body. What about things like hip hinges? Like, that's a deadlift. Why don't you do a deadlift, right? Anything for the back body. Then, third category of four, strengthen the front body. So I tell my athletes, okay, if you can learn your, so we're going back to the ABCs, the alignment of your spine, you got to learn where your new neutral is. You're no longer 40 weeks pregnant. So this big arch in your back and the sweat, it doesn't serve you anymore, but it did when you were 40 weeks pregnant. But if you're not, where the heck should you be? So then strengthening front body and neutral will help you reinforce that. So obviously you wouldn't start with the floor plank, but all of my athletes are gonna be able to do a floor plank by the time they're done with me because you need that bracing strength. And then the last part, is the bending and twisting of the front body. So, I mean, one wouldn't do this exercise. Here's my yoga block. But you wouldn't do this to start with. But an average person, okay, depending on your sport, but one should be able to bend backwards with no pain in your lower back and no fear of opening up the front body. So that kind of hits a lot of points where like psychologically are you fearful wait do you have a chronic low back pain that had never been addressed before now's the chance to like get rid of it right because you are rehabbing you might as well rehab your back too right so those are the four categories of exercises sorry sorry movements that i go through we don't we don't use the e-word no i actually <laughs> love that you're addressing it in categories right because i think this makes it way more accessible for people to like do on their own because then it's not like you have to memorize 45 different exercises it's like i know now four categories and like i'm gonna figure out a way to move like that in my own life and you just kind of think your way through it and feel it in your body and i think that's yeah that's brilliant i love it yeah and, it, and it's like with these muscles the reason what she's doing is so important is because just as you're going through your pregnancy, it's like this slow progression over nine months of kind of downloading like a different software for, for your muscles. Yes. And so it's like, I, I talk to people about like, you have the hardware of your body, which is like the structure and then the neurological signals going to the muscles and stuff. That's your software. And we have to update our software. And that's essentially what a chiropractic adjustment does that I think a lot of people don't really get, right? Like they think of it as like cracking and fixing your hurt shoulder. No, we're updating your software basically. And we're like helping your body communicate better. So everything that she's doing, all these movements, all these different planes of movements that she's doing things in the four categories she's talking talking about it's like downloading all these updates for your software so that your muscles can fire correctly after nine months of having a different software installed so ah. now you have to update and download the next software oh I, I like how you describe that because I think what that what that did for me anyways is it really drove home the point that rehab is not about strength because strength takes six to eight weeks to develop it's about recalibration about, that's just what it is yeah so when you're resetting the software that can that takes time and compresses it like it's very instantaneous it can be and you and i have seen it in our practice for the person who comes in and can't raise their arm past here you do a little bit of feldman christ and then suddenly it's like oh i didn't even know i could do that <laughs> right yeah. so the software was a little funky so i love i love how you refer to it as software i might i might have to steal that. oh steal it go for it Good. it's like i Good. i like talking to people and it's like i'll talk to different people about different things right but that's something that like most people can understand it's like your yes. iphone just doesn't work as well when you like don't do the updates even the though iOS, it's yeah. it just doesn't work as well and your battery <laughs> dies and like all, all that stuff and same thing with your computer. Gonna it's going to mess up. I don't want to learn the new iOS. What do you mean? The search bar's at the bottom. I have too much of a oh, change. I know. I know. I feel it. But it's like, that's exactly what you're doing, right? You're like getting yeah. your body to recalibrate the signals that it sends back and forth between the brain and the body. And then it's like, 
everything that she's talking about and like all the fashion, this is why I love working with perinatal stuff when mm -hmm. moms are pregnant. And a lot of people get scared of the chiropractor when they're pregnant, but it's like, no, we work really, really differently with pregnant moms. And like, and I, I do a bunch of different techniques. So when it comes to moms, it's a lot about working with the fascia and all the stuff that we've already been talking about, right? It's like most of the focus of chiropractic in the perinatal period is like balancing the pelvis and balancing the ligaments that connect to the uterus so that you don't get like weird twisting and pulling on the uterus. Then it can actually make for a much more pleasant birth process. And sure. afterwards, it's the update of the software and the okay. balancing of the system that helps your body get into this healing state. And a lot of that comes from facilitating proper movement in the body, which is exactly what Jeanette is doing in all of her programs. It's like facilitating proper movement, sending signals back up to the brain so the brain can recalibrate them and then send the proper signals back down to the muscles so that when you do get back to working out, you do get back to being active, your muscles yeah. are actually responding in the right way instead of like responding in this kind of like mm, off kilter funky way. Yeah. So, that's where yeah. all of this comes in and why everything she's doing is so important. I think at the end of the day, it's also very empowering for people here listening to understand that you actually are such a powerful therapist. Yes. Like, you don't, you don't need to see Christine and I every single day. A lot of people think, oh my God, I'm going to need therapy forever. No, the point is there's so much that you can physically do on your own. Movements is one of them. Scar massage is another one of them. And literally, if you just <sighs> knew the little things to do for five minutes a day, it's literally not complicated. And, and Christine and my job is the, well, it is the easiest job. We just kind of, here you go, this is what you need to do. <laughs> you got to do it. So your outcomes are completely under your control. You can make a change. And it doesn't matter if you're listening to me before that six month mark where the scar tissue can be changed or after the six month mark where we're talking about fashion mobility. There's an answer for everybody. So if you're sitting there with pain of any kind, one out of 10 pain to nine out of 10 pain, none of that pain needs to be your new normal find out what's causing it and let's get to the bottom of it. Yeah. And that's exactly why I love this kind of work, right? It's Cause it's like, well, instead of like, Oh, let's just like make the, make you not feel the pain. It's like, no, let's figure out where it's coming from and resolve it and fix it and exactly. help the body like function in a better, more effective way. So I, I know we're coming up on the end of the hour and I love everything that we've covered. So for those who kind of um, popped on late, if you want to go back through the video, we kind of talked at the beginning, we talked about what happens in a C-section, like what that looks like and like the different cuts that they do just so that if that were to happen, you like aren't surprised and you aren't yeah. scared and like, you know, it can be okay. Um, and then we talked about like what fascia is and its role in the body and how it ties down into the rest of the body and like why it you and then I would suggest watching the other videos Jeanette has on her um, Instagram because she talks about like how to manage like a tight pelvic floor after a c-section and why that's a thing and like why you might have a tighter pelvic floor than before and that's tied to fascia and all that kind of stuff and how to work with that how to resolve that we talked about diastasis recti which is like the splitting of the abdominal muscles and like how to help them kind of heal back together in a really natural way we talked about nutrition being a huge component of that because like your body your body is amazing and it has incredible healing capacity but it needs the building blocks. So you yeah. gotta give it the building blocks. And that comes from nutrition. And then we talked about scar tissue healing and like how you can kind of massage the scar to basically help the fibers realign correctly. Uh, we talked about the four major categories of movement, which was opening the front, strengthening the back, strengthening the front body, and then bending and twisting. And you can rewind and Jeanette did an amazing demo of all of those. So. I loved it. Thank you so much for all your time today. Oh, you're awesome. And then will you tell people about the summit you have coming up and like if they want to watch that or connect oh, with you, yeah. what's the best way? For sure. So the C Summit is catchy name, right? I can't take credit. <laughs> I think it's amazing. C Summit is uh, in celebration of April, which is Caesarean Awareness Month. And what was beginning as a, a workshop or two has become a month long virtual event of now over 10 workshops where I'll be running, but we're also going to have expert interviews all through the entire month. Now, while it starts next week, every week has its own theme and you can sign up and register for at any time. This is a free summit. It's free. Oh, wow. 
Amazing. It's free. So the thing is, okay, so we're talking about cesarean preparation and cesarean recovery. My wheelhouse is obviously in the recovery side, but I mean, like the prep work is also very important from, you know, what do I do from a physical standpoint? So um, what I want everybody to understand is also that what you and I talked about today, the exercise bit, that's highlighted in the last and the second last weeks of April. So if you missed out, please obviously register for the C-Summit and you'll get access to all the workshops more in depth specifically about the exercises. And then the scar massage is what we're going to be talking about a ton at the beginning half of the C-Summit. So, and there might be a lot of prizes. I'm just saying, I'm really good at finding prizes. So you might want to come too, Christine. <laughs> uh, hey, I There's love some really good stuff. prizes. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. And then maybe you can send me uh, just like the links for everything. And then I'll put it in the description when I upload the recording. That's awesome. Yeah, do that. But also everybody, you can register the link in my bio and I'm at Ask Jeanette. But yes, I will. I'll just type it in after you post this. Actually, you know what? It's Jeanette E. How about this? www.jeanette.com e.com backslash backslash c summit so for anybody who's oh, nice. wanting, that's pretty easy that's easy yeah we can pick that so we can we can add that to the uh, the end of the um, igtv so christine's going to be saving this on her platform for future reference mm -hmm. yeah yep. amazing Thanks. thank you so much any last thoughts or comments yeah, we should do this again because we're really going to yeah. focus on um, CrossFit, Return to CrossFit. <laughs> awesome. I love it. I have a bunch of CrossFitters who will be thrilled. <laughs> well, thank you so much. And I can't wait to check out your summit. And I hope you have a great rest of your day. Amazing. You as well. Thanks for having me, Christine. No problem.